All right. Well, uh, I think we can get started. I want to thank everybody for joining our group today. Uh, this is the first time we've met in a non-Thursday for a good bit. We meet the first Thursday typically of every month. Um, and we continue to bring you um, great presentations. Uh, we are have a uh, we do have a physical presence location that we are not using right now, and we are only virtual. But we do plan to return to that physical presence. Uh, we are thinking beginning of next year. So we will see how that turns out. Hopefully, we can do it because there is definitely some benefits to do seeing each other face to face. Um, but like I said, until then, we will continue to bring you great speakers and great um, topics. Today is no exception. We've got uh, the fantastic Sam Nazar. And he's going to be talking about adding machine learning to .NET applications. Uh, Sam has been a software developer since 1995, focusing mostly on Microsoft technologies. He's a senior software engineer with NIS Technologies, where he consults and teaches clients about the latest .NET technologies. Sam has achieved multiple certifications from Microsoft, including MCSA, MCAD, MCTS, and MCT, and is a leader of the Cleveland C Sharp and VB.NET user group since 2003. Which, you know, Sam, I think that's, I want to say that's the same year that we started the Roanoke Wild Outdoor User Group. Wow. Yeah, wow. Happy coincidence. No, it is. Um, so, Sam, in addition, he's the leader of the .NET study group and uh, author for Visual Studio Magazine and a five-time Microsoft MVP, when not coding. Uh, Sam loves spending time with his family and friends and volunteer at his local church. Thank you very much, Sam, again, for joining with us. Thank you, Olga, and uh, thank you everyone for having me. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. A little bit about me. Uh, as Olga mentioned, my name is Sam Nasser, and you can find me on Twitter using the at Sam Nasser handle. I've been a software developer since 1995. I'm a senior software engineer for NIS Technologies, where I do consulting as well as teaching. Uh, I've been certified with a few certs from Microsoft, and uh, I run the Cleveland C Sharp VB.NET user group, as well as the .NET study group. And I think this is all things that uh, Tolga had mentioned, so we'll fly right through that. <clears throat> But more importantly, I wanted to give a shameless plug to the Cleveland C-Sharp VB.NET user group. Uh, we meet every month. Uh, meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we cover all topics related to .NET. Uh, you can find the meeting information on meetup.com, and I posted the link in the chat window. Um, we also wanted to, I also wanted to mention that next month, we're, or rather in May this month, we're going to have Julie Learman uh, speaking about um, EF.core, uh, excuse me, EF, uh, EF in core.net. Sorry, <laughs> EF and .NET Core. That's what I wanted to, to get out, yes. And uh, she's going to be uh, presenting on the fourth Thursday. And then the, the following fourth Thursday in June, we're going to have Seth Juarez talking about uh, a Q&A for machine learning.net in general. So some great meetings coming up. Highly encourage you all to, to join and uh, participate in the meetings. So a little bit of overview about uh, tonight's topic. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the machine learning and how we're going to add that to .NET Core apps. Uh, we're going to use a, a model for providing the machine learning and then incorporate that within a given application. Once we do that, then that model will be available for us either in an in online or offline scenario. And we train that model basically using a pattern of data, which will teach it versus using explicit logic like a specific formula. So we're gonna feed it a set of data and we're gonna identify the, the data that it reads and the, the value that that data should have. And then we'll build and train that model uh, going forward. So with ML.NET, uh, basically it's a model uh, and it's, it's an object that contains the transformations performed on the data to produce the end result or a prediction. So some of these things may be uh, a simple linear regression, similar to what we see over here on the left, uh, where you have a simple linear regression as you proceed, as the value of X increases, so does the value of Y, but it can also be inversely proportional, like, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, like the graph over on the right, where you have the HDL cholesterol uh, which is the good cholesterol, and then you have your BMI or body mass index. As your body mass increases, your good cholesterol drops. So that is an inverse proportion uh, shown there, but still within a linear regression. So essentially what we're doing here is we're giving the, the, the model some data to train on, and then it will be able to identify the, the trend uh, from that data. So some terminology to keep us all on the same page. Uh, whenever we talk about a feature, it's basically the input of a machine learning. Uh, so we're going to give it uh, things like uh, the, the size of a home as far as square footage or mileage for a vehicle. And then the label is the, the output uh, price. So, for example, if we specify a thousand square foot home, we're also going to give it a label to say that uh, that thousand square foot home is going to be, let's just say, 100,000 for easy math. And likewise, uh, the next value, it'll be 2,000 square feet and the, the value will be 200,000. Likewise, we can do the same thing with, uh, with cars. 
the mileage uh, as well as the, the, the price are inversely proportional. As the mileage goes up, the price of the vehicle goes down. So again, a feature is the input for the machine learning model. The label is the output value that we wanted to train on. And then the, uh, the transform is the type of prediction that it will be making. So what are some of the types of predictions that it can make? Here we have a, a short list. So we can classify items. So let's say um, if we were doing image classification, uh, it would look at an item and say that's a fruit versus that's a vegetable, uh, or maybe that's a plant. Uh, we can use regression in the similar examples that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in addition, we can look at anomaly detection. So if we have uh, a regular spending pattern for your credit card usage, and all of a sudden uh, there's a spike. So instead of the $500 that I'm spending every month at Costco, all of a sudden I'm spending 2000 Obviously, that's going to be a spike. So that will be uh, a detection that it will pick up. You can also use it to make recommendations. So I'm sure we've all shopped on a website called Amazon.com, right? That's where half of our paycheck goes usually. Uh, and a lot of times when you purchase something, you'll see that it's making a recommendation for something else that goes along with it. So for example, if I was to purchase a lawnmower on there, it will come up with uh, possibly a chainsaw or a an edger um, or a weed trimmer. So things that will go along with that product and it will make those recommendations. There's also time series sequential data. Uh, and obviously, as the name suggests, it, it varies depending on the time and it's sequential as far as the, the values that were being fed into it. And then image classification kind of ties in with the classification categorization that I mentioned earlier, where it will take an image and then identify that as either fruit, vegetable, plant, or what have you. So there are many different models or predictions that we can use within machine learning to be able to develop the model. Now, when we talk about model development, basically it's a cyclical process. So what you see here is this is a graph from the Microsoft Docs. And you'll see at the very beginning, at the very top under build model, we have collect and load data. And so that's the first step. Uh, once we get that, we're going to create a pipeline. And you notice that there are these method names that are listed underneath, like append or under train model. There's a fit method. So these are methods that we can use to programmatically manipulate the model, either to create the pipeline, to train it, or to evaluate it. So um, we essentially start by getting the data, then we create the pipeline, then we train it on that data. And then after we're done training it, we want to evaluate it. How well did we train it? Now, when you're training a model, think of it like you're training a three-year-old basically, right? So we've all come across three-year-olds and you you know, you know, show them different objects. Like I show my niece, you know, this is a hairbrush, right? Whereas this is not a hairbrush, this is a cell phone. So I'm showing her different things and training her. This is what, this is X, this is Y. Now, obviously hairbrushes don't just come in one size, they come in a variety of sizes and colors. So I wanna show her a different varieties so that way she understands really what is a hairbrush and how does it differ from a cell phone or any other object? So after I train the model, I want to evaluate it and test it. So if I basically throw something at it and say, is this a hairbrush? It should come back and say, negative, that is not a hairbrush. And likewise, if I ask it, is this a hairbrush? Then the response should be true or, or yes. So that's where the evaluation comes in. And if you notice, it's a cyclical process in the sense that if I'm not happy with the evaluation results, feed it more data, create the pipeline, train it again, and then reevaluate. And it's cyclical until I get to the point where I'm satisfied with the test results. And again, think of a, a three-year-old child. You keep feeding them various inputs until they eventually recognize what that object is repeatedly. Once I get to the stage that I'm satisfied with it, you see that under fit, basically there's a, a dotted arrow that goes into saving the model. So now I've trained it, I'm satisfied with the results. Now I can save that model uh, or use the save method so that way it can be used in another project. And as we'll see in the demo, what you're doing is you're gonna have a project for training the model. After you're done training it, you're then going to take that model and use it in another project. So that way you can have it a, a, a model for your production use, but at the same time, you still retain that original model in case you need to retrain it or make adjustments and then redeploy it again to your production environment. Let me just pause here for a second and see if there's any questions. I know I threw a lot of terms out. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to jump into uh, chat or speak up verbally. So. Yeah, I do have a question. So I think, you know, you're describing machine learning principle in like, in the, I feel like the, in, in principles of machine learning. Now, is this a library that we're using that implements these or is there like one or more or is this specific? I feel like this is more general to machine learning, but, or is this more specific to the library that you're using to do the machine learning for us? So I did a little bit of both where I discussed the overall fundamentals of machine learning, where you're training it and evaluating it and then saving that model. But likewise, when you see those different method names inside those boxes, like append and fit, those pertain only to the, the .NET world. 
Um, and then within the .NET world, there's a, a library or a NuGet package that you can use in your project to be able to utilize machine learning. So to answer your question, a little bit of both. Got it. Any other questions? All right, and again, let's try to make it a round table discussion as much as possible. Feel free to jump in at any point in time. Uh, I have no issues being interrupted. Um, I like to give and take. So uh, with that said, let's push on. So we talked about it being a cyclical process. Once I'm satisfied, then I use the, the save model or the save method as I see at the bottom of the diagram. And what that entails is basically once I have the model saved, now I can actually load that model into my, uh, into my application and be able to start making predictions. So that's at the point where I'm no longer evaluating it, but now I'm using it in a production use where I give it something like this and I say, is this a hairbrush? And then it will tell me yes or no. Uh, or like I said, many of the other examples that we talked about before, I feed it in the mileage of a vehicle and it will come back with a, a prediction on what the price should be. So keep in mind, there are methods that are being utilized here that we'll talk about later. Um, but essentially once I, I'm ready to use it in my .NET application, there are some prerequisites that need to be in place. So with .NET 6, I essentially have to install the, um, the .NET uh, desktop environment. And then I need to select machine learning as I see over here on the right. If I don't do that, what's gonna happen is when I try to add machine learning and I do that by right clicking on a project and selecting add in machine learning as you see here in the context menu, I'm not gonna see that if I don't add it in uh, in the desktop environment. So it, it's critical that I need to do that. Now, once I have that set up, there are multiple ways that I can add in the ML.NET into my uh, application. So first is using the UI. And as you see here, I'm right clicking on the, uh, the, the project and utilizing the context menu to be able to add in a machine learning model, or I can do it programmatically using the Microsoft ML NuGet package, or I can use everyone's favorite, the command line interface. So three different ways of adding machine learning into an existing project. And so with that, let's jump into a demo. All right. So what you see is basically a uh, the the beginning of uh, Visual Studio 22 um, entrance screen, if you will, or, or basically it's, uh, I'm creating a new project. And so I have it narrowed down to C Sharp, and I'm going to create a console application. So I'm going to go ahead and select the console app, and this is in .NET Core or .NET 6, I should say. And so we'll give it a name of, let's say, uh, console demo, and we'll put this in another folder. We're going to use .NET 6 long-term support. And then click Create, and give it a minute to chug and create a basic uh, console application. All right, so here we are. We have the console demo. And now what I need to do at this stage, right click on it, and I'm going to select add. And there I see my machine learning model. Again, because I had done the prerequisite work of adding the uh, desktop environment and machine learning when I, through my installer, I now have that option available to me in the context window. So I'm going to be creating the machine learning through the user interface. So I will go ahead and click that. And this seems a little bit uh, redundant, but again, I'm gonna select machine learning model ml.net. And in this case, we'll just leave it as mlmodel1.mbconfig, select add. And now I see a splash screen that's gonna walk me through uh, all the different questions and, and things in order to get my ML model set up. So what I wanna be doing here is I wanna select the value prediction. And if you notice, you no, know, that went by a little too quickly. You'll notice under each pane, it tells you whether you can do it locally, or in some cases you can run it in Azure or use it locally. So for my value prediction, I'm just going to use uh, the, the, local, um, the, the local model. And so we'll double click that. Now it's telling me that's gonna utilize the local CPU, which I already understand. And it also specifies Azure and GPU are currently not supported for this scenario, accepted. Now we move on to the next step, the data. So as we mentioned earlier, with the ML, basically I have to create a pipeline and give it data in order to, to feed it. So I have two options. I can select from a given file or from SQL Server. So I currently have a file that I downloaded from uh, University of California, which is basically um, some uh, Yelp comments. And let me go ahead and uh, browse over to that folder. So that is in presentations, ml.net. And we have- so Did this yeah. tell us what, what model it's gonna use? Yeah, that was already specified in the, the previous scenario. No, no, I mean like what it's gonna actually use, like is it gonna use a random forest or is it gonna try and use like um, 
gradient boosted trees or something like that? So it's um, basically once I specify the scenario that I want to use, when I start to train it, it's going to run through a variety of different algorithms. And you'll see that uh, it'll be shown on the screen uh, in the output window. OK, so it like automatically picks a model for you. It'll run through a variety of them and it will train on them. And then depending on the time that you allow it, it will run through more of those algorithms and produce better results. And I'll touch more on that as we proceed. All right, so mentioned environment, data. Now we can browse to that file. So I have some data that I downloaded or that the University of California had provided. And basically it's a flat text file. And let me go ahead and open that up in Notepad so you can see what it's like. Basically, I'm gonna have a comment and then a one or a zero value to indicate whether that comment is good or bad, whether it's toxic or it's uh, acceptable, <clears throat> positive or negative. So as you see here, cost is not good. The value is zero. Wow, love this place. The value is one, so on and so forth. So all those comments, basically it's a tab delimited file and it's just the, the, uh, the sentiment as well as the, the value pertaining to that sentiment. So let me go ahead and close that. I'll select that file. How many lines was that? Uh, so that was, it brought in 1,000 rows, um, and that file was kind of minimized. Obviously, the more data you have, the better it's going to be trained, kind of like what we talked about earlier. The more examples you show, the more it will be, uh, or the better trained it will be. <clears throat> and so now it's going to prompt me for the column to predict uh, or the label. Um, so this is what you want to predict. So in this case, I'm going to use column one to predict. And then I'm going to use the next step. Now it's asking me for the time that I want to allow for the training. I'm just going to leave it at 10 seconds for now. And then once I click start training, you'll see that it's going to run through a variety of algorithms. And let me expand the output window. Oh, 10 seconds. That's super fast. So now it went through a couple of trainers or algorithms, as we see here. So we have fast forest regression and then fast tree Tweety regression. Um, and then all that is listed as far as the amount of time that it spent, uh, some data regarding how well it was trained and how uh, the, the deviation for the data for the linear regression. And so keep in mind, I just kept it 10 seconds just to be brief, right? So now, there we go. Now I'll move on to the next step. Now it's asking me to predict the, uh, to evaluate the model. So as you see here, it gave me some data as far as the, the best model that was used, which is fast forest regression. Uh, and then it's asking me, try your model. So I can say, wow, love this place. What is that value? 0.88. So typically anything higher than a, a, a 0.5 will indicate, obviously you round up, it will indicate whether it's positive or negative, but that's how confident it is. So let's say that I'm satisfied with it at this stage. Now I can click next step. And let me collapse the output window a little bit so we can see the whole thing. So now you see where that on the, we are on the consume tab. And within the consume tab, it's telling me I can use this code snippet to see if let's say be able to leverage the, the model. If I look over on the right hand side, you see that it created this ML model one dot MB config, which is the machine learning model that I selected earlier. And then it built some additional files underneath it. Initially, when I started the project, it was just a plain console application. And all I had in it was just the program CS. But now, as I progress through these screens, it built that uh, ML model one for me. Now that I've built it, I've trained it and evaluated it, now I'm ready to actually put it to use. So in order to put it to use, there's a variety of things that I can do. I can either use this code snippet that's displayed for me here with a copy link, or I can add it in as a, another console project into my application, or I can add it as a web API project into my application, or my solution, I should say. So I'm gonna go ahead and utilize another console app and I'll click add to solution. And what project name do I want? And we'll keep it as ML model one console app one. So if you notice over on the right in the solution explorer, I only have one project right now. When I click add to solution, it automatically created the second solution. And now I'm able to use it. You'll see that I have the ML model one MB config both here as well as in the new project that it created for me. And the reason for that is this ML model console app one, that's mimicking my production type scenario. So it took that model that I created in the first project, trained it, evaluated it, and now it copied it over into my new project or my production project, which now I can, I can use. And if I ever need to make any changes, I still have everything in my original project to retrain it 
and modify it and then ship it out to production again. Make sense? Yeah, so I can tell my boss that I wrote a <laughs> machine learning application, but actually all I did is press generate. That's <laughs> I mean, let's keep it between us, but yes, you can, uh, you can mention that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, as we had mentioned, uh, really a couple cool. of button clicks. Uh, it's one of three methods for creating your, your model within your app. And now we're able to uh, get up and running with it. OK. Mm. Any other questions? Hey, Sam, uh, when, you, uh, <clears throat> when you were training the model, you gave it 10 seconds. Uh, but let's say you gave it three hours or something you know, if you weren't in any particular hurry. Is there any relationship between the amount of time you spend training it and the amount and the time it's going to take for runtime? Or is the runtime going to be? Uh, the, the same no matter what. So when in your second project, I guess maybe I'll see this in a second, but in, in the second project, when you go to use this, is it always going to run uh, at a constant rate of speed or uh, is it going to vary depending on how big your sample was when you trained it and how long you, you ran the training process? So the, the speed at which it will, it will run is not necessarily dictated by the amount of data that I gave it. Basically, the whole training process is to get a good prediction model out of it. Um, think of it this way. I am giving it data and it's building a formula uh, or a way of predicting what the output is going to be. So it's not necessarily going to make it run faster, but it's just going to make it a, a better predictor or create a better formula. Okay. So when you actually get around to, to actually using the project then as you're, as you're about to do now, then the, the uh, runtime speed is going to, uh, is, is independent of the training process. Correct. Okay. Thanks. The whole point about the training um, process is the accuracy, not so much the speed and performance. So if you're using forest though, and you want to get more accurate, you often need more trees in your forest. So there's a chance that asking for higher accuracy will generate either more trees or deeper trees. So it might change your runtime slightly. Slightly, but typically your the time that you train it is used to essentially uh, have better accuracy. Uh, that's the primary factor of it. You're is there right. Like a option to train until you can't train anymore. Option <laughs> like uh, like a thousand records. You wouldn't think you could do much more than you know a few minutes worth of crunching. There are some general guidelines that we'll talk about later uh, as far as the amount of data versus the time to train. But really what it, comes, what it comes down to is the evaluation. Because let's face it, every data that's being fed to it is going to be different than the other. So really, no two scenarios are going to be identical. Does that answer your question, Kova? Yeah, I get it. Um, all right. So where we left off is basically we were able to create another project that has the, the model in it. Uh, and I noticed Drew left a comment uh, that presumes you found a good source of data. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, that was when Tolga was asking, can I just tell my boss I did ML by clicking a button? And like, yes, but it's going to be trash if you don't take time to get your clean data. Exactly. Uh, I'll blame the data, data guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, Tolga? I'll blame the data guys for that. I wrote the code. I can't help it. The data there was you bad. Yeah. That's I mean, often the, often the hardest part of getting a good ML model is getting clean data. Exactly. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about it, Sam, but, uh, it, you know, I'm assuming, like, uh, I work in retail and we, you know, we, we get, we stream a lot of transactions, you know, a million transactions a day. I'm assuming we can be building that, you know, there's a, you know, we, we kind of did it by hand here, where we took a text file and entered it in. Are you going to talk about how you would consume data and be running a model in the background? Or is that always something that you would um, do at a particular time, like at the end of the day, you get all the records from today and you would still run this separate process that would train, or is there like a streaming mode where you can keep streaming, keep analyzing, and mm -hmm. the model is constantly changing kind of thing? Or is it, like I said, you have to do it at certain times, like daily, you, you know, you take all the records and modify, you know, add it to your current model. Hmm, see. <laughs> I'm not so, sure what questions to ask here. So <laughs> I think I know what you're getting at. So basically what you want to do is, first of all, like we talked about, clean your data. You, you got to have good scrub data that's being fed into it. And typically with a lot of organizations, you have a lot of historical data that you can rely on. The key is you need to clean it up first before you, you feed it into the, uh, the machine learning model. Uh, the second thing is you're going to need to train it going forward. Uh, and so with every day as you accumulate data, essentially you're feeding it additional tidbits, right, to, to uh, basically manage the, the current forecast uh, of your, your sales records or uh, price predictions. So you can there is no streaming feature that I know of, but essentially you can continue to feed it data going forward and just add on to it and continue to train it and then redeploy your model. So again, you see how I have two different projects, one with the ml model one.mb config, and it's listed in two places, 
So I can retrain this one again and then redeploy it out into my application, my production application. Now, when you train it, the more records, the better. So we're talking about historical data, depending on your scenario, it could be 30 days, could be a year or, or what have you. So if you wanna constantly keep it up to date and, and train the current days uh, or for the current days uh, data, that's gonna be a process where you gotta scrub the data, add it onto the existing data and then retrain it. Gotcha. So in some cases, it's not useful, it's not that useful to train it day by day, but rather to just add in large lump sums like for an entire week or so. Are you starting over every time? So for example, we have this model here that we mm -hmm. train out a thousand records. Uh, and let's say we do that daily and you know, we keep accumulating I guess you could do like a running last 30 days or whatever, but uh, are, are you having to retrain it from scratch every day? Or is there a way to say, well, here is, it's a pretty good model. You know, we've been training it for the last year. We're just going to modify it for today's transactions, you know, like alter it. Or is that not a thing? You have to retrain, you know, last year's worth of records if that's what you want to do over again. You can't just add a day's worth. Uh, good question. I'd, I'd have to look into that, but I'm pretty sure you have to add it on to the existing data and keep training it. Um, reason being, if you, and again, I'm, I'm not 100% certain of that, but if you were to train it only on a given set of data, it's only going to look at just that given set. Uh, you'd want to essentially have it look at the entire broad spectrum and train it on that. Makes sense. Uh, but let me look into that and, and get back to you just to be certain. Uh, Drew left a comment. You'd either need some amazing uh, CI or feel very lucky to have a model you are actively using doing online training. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of goes with what we were talking about. You'd want to include it with the, the previous data as well uh, to do that. So typically, they, a lot of organizations, they wait, they, they gather a weeks at a time or a month, add it onto the, the historic data, and then train it, depending on how much you want to update your model, really. Any other questions? I'll be an acronym police there, CI. Uh, what I mean is um, they have, you can have models that you can train online. The problem is you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. So if you're using this for business purposes and you're not very carefully validating it, you might just be getting trash out of it. And now you're making business decisions with a model you haven't verified. So I think most people train in big batches and update the model periodically after verifying it. And that's the key is the evaluation process, right? What's the point of just training it if I don't evaluate it? I'm essentially shooting darts in the dark. So you could do this live, but you'd have to have a very you have to be very comfortable with your like live CI like continuous integration verifier, and you have to trust gotcha. it very strongly. Yeah, that's where the again verification is the key right there. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, this is good. So where we left off is again we had just added on to another project, but you'll notice that I got a message up here on the right. Uh, this project is targeting a version of .NET which is not installed, which I thought was very interesting. So with this project, the initial project that I created was in .NET 6. And as you see here, the new project that it added on, and let's look at project properties, .NET 5. Why is that? I don't know. But that's, that's what happens, and that's a little gotcha. But easy to fix, simply from the dropdown, select .NET 6, and then rebuild the solution. And we should be good to go. And so while that's finishing up, you'll notice that the model is essentially housed in a ML model one dot zip file. And the zip file is what's copied over into the new project. When I look over in my next console project, <clears throat> you'll see that um, we're utilizing the model basically like a class. So we're instantiating the model, doing a new for ML model one dot model input. And if you recall in the initial diagram that I showed where we had things like, uh, predict and uh, save and all these various methods, this is where they come into play. So now that I have my objects instantiated, I can use the predict method and I can pass it in some sample data. And that sample data, basically what it did is it took the first row of that record and now it's able to make a prediction using the, uh, the predict method of the model. And then the results that I get back is the uh, prediction results. And then it just displays the score down here. So when I run this, first of all, let me make this the starting application. And I'll go ahead and click start. There we go. So now, as you see in the output, it's using the uh, the first column, love this place. The value is a one. And then the predicted column one came back with a 
0.8775 to be exact, right? Which is a high confidence score uh, of that value. And if we go back here, so. Essentially, these values were extracted from the prediction results, as we see here, the prediction result score. Okay. So very easy way of generating the model and then using that in another project and being able to run the predict and get the sample output value and display it in a console window. Easy peasy. Very cool. Okay. Any questions? So this was a very straightforward way of doing it within a console application, very simplistic. Um, but we were using the, the method where we did everything through the UI, we basically point and click, answer a couple questions, point it to the data, and then we're off and running. Now let's take a look at something that's a little bit more programmatically involved. So let me go ahead and minimize this and we'll close that. And we'll bring in another example. And let's minimize this. And this is for house prices. So let's step through the solution for this one. And again, this is another console application um, and this is used for predicting house prices. And instead of using the, uh, the, the, the user interface and selecting and pointing and clicking, now I'm doing everything programmatically. So for starters, I have house data and we're just going off of the simple prediction that the, the price of the home is equivalent to the square footage, period, point blank. Realistically, however, we know that the price of a home varies on a lot of things, not just square footage, but location, the, the, uh, the zip code that it's in, um, the surrounding area, a variety of things. And so uh, number of bathrooms, bedrooms, so on. But for this case, let's just focus on square footage and the price. So with that, I have my, uh, my data structure for size and price, both are set to float, and I'm calling this house data. And then I have another class called prediction, where the price is going to be uh, referred to as the score. And so now I'm gonna be doing everything programmatically. So starting in main, what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate my ML context or machine learning context. I'm going to create some training data, which is essentially an array of records. So I have some house data with 1,100 square feet is equivalent to uh, 120,000. Uh, 2,800 square feet is equivalent to 300,000 in price and so on. And so if you recall from the previous slide where we said we have things that are features and things that are labels. Uh, and so in order to set up the training, I have to specify what's a feature and what is a label. And so in step 1B here, I'm setting up the, I'm importing the training data and so here's the house data that I specified, and then I'm loading that into my ML context. Once I load that data, now I'm gonna specify within my pipeline, I'm gonna specify what is a feature, which is the size of the, of the home, and then the label column is going to be the price. And this is all part of the ML context. So I'm specifying all those properties. Once I do that, now I wanna train the model, and then I do that by using the, the fit method. So once it's trained, now I actually have to uh, evaluate it. And I do that by making a prediction. So I check the prediction for a specific home that's 2,500 square feet. And I check the price. And then it will display that within my uh, console window. So if we go ahead and run through that. I put a breakpoint at the very beginning. And we'll be able to step through it. So here it's instantiating my machine learning context. Now I'm getting the training data, which is essentially a hard-coded array. Now I'm gonna load the data. Next step is to identify the, the feature or the size and the label, which is the price. Then I'm gonna run it through for the, the training model. And it's going to train. Now that it's trained, I'm going to evaluate it so I have a house data record that's set to 2,500 square feet. And the price that I get for that, and let's open up the output window, 277,500. So if we look at where we were at, this is a 2,500 square foot home. I trained it on the data where uh, 1,900 square feet is uh, 230,000, a 2,800 square feet is 300,000. And so 
a good estimate for a 2,500 square foot home is 277,000. So as we see here, it's a linear regression model that I created and was able to predict the price within the range of the data that I had given it. It's pretty impressive considering your data is only four records. I'm sorry, pretty impressive considering. It's only, you know, the input data is only four records. You know, <laughs> I, yeah. I always thought, you know, these models would require thousands at least to have anything useful. So you can figure out that it's a linear regression and then build something from it. Yeah, I have well, no idea been... you could just base on, I mean, obviously this is probably not a realistic test, but, you know, smaller models still work. That's, um, yeah. hmm. it works, but again, it's really in order to get into a real world scenario, what else would I have to do here? What other features would I have to identify? The number of bedrooms, number of baths, the, the zip code, the condition of the home, any other previous damage, whether it's fire, ants, mold, uh, a variety of things. Is it in a, in a flood area? Um, is it near a volcano? Uh, you know, a variety of different things that I need to identify to get a better prediction on the price of that home. But for this purpose, I'm just keeping it very simple to, to kind of get the point across. And I hope I did that so far. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so now we are, we are paused and I'll go ahead and hit enter and it'll take us to the next break point in the app. That didn't take, so let's try it again. Here we go. So now let me fast forward. Um, I can retrain it again on some additional data, but then more importantly, when I get down here, this is where if I'm satisfied with the data, now I can actually save that model as a dot zip. And so if we continue down, we're gonna evaluate it. We're gonna display some data regarding the regression and then we save the model and then exit the app. Now let's go over into Solution Explorer and open it in Windows Explorer. And you'll see when I was open my bin directory under debug, I have a model.zip with a date and time of May 4th, 7.06 p.m., which is literally a minute ago. So it saves that model as a .zip. For those that are curious, like I am, you get into the, the training, it's a .zip file. Typically, you, you don't have to go in manually and manipulate it. But if you do, just out of the sake of curiosity, there isn't a whole lot you're going to find. Um, mostly within the transform chain, it's going to be a lot of unreadable texts. So nothing that I can do anything with uh, directly, but of course I can manipulate it by retraining the model repeatedly. Any questions before we get back to the remainder of the slides? All right. Hey Sam, uh, one question. Uh, going back to uh, uh, at the at the time, I wasn't uh, I didn't know enough about what we were going to look at to sort of pay attention. But when you very, made the very first selection uh, uh, to create the very first project to train your data, you had a screen full of options. Was or that was that based on the kind of the shape of the data that you were expecting to use? Uh, are you referring to? Oh, sorry, wrong one. This would have been the first project when you were actually uh, as in this yeah yeah that's it right there so yeah so if you recall we, we were talking about there are different ways to train the data and different model types so right. there's data classification oh shoot value prediction which is what we were after every time i click on one it goes to the next tab so uh, okay. i can't highlight them but essentially <laughs> there are various scenarios that you can choose from um so the one that i chose was basically predicting a value okay that makes sense as we got into this i kept thinking to myself what if your data looks different? And then I remember that you had this screen at the beginning, and I right. it kind of uh, it went it went by pretty fast for me because I, I wasn't really expecting didn't know what to expect later on. But gotcha. that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I have no problems going back. Um, but yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's go back into our PowerPoint, and. Okay, so the question that we talked about earlier with the time to train. So this is a general rule of thumb from Microsoft. Zero to 10 megabytes is 10 seconds. 10 to 100 megabytes is 10 minutes. 
this just gives you a, a rough idea. But typically, you train until your evaluation process is satisfactory. Uh, and you do that by uh, training it on a variety of data and then testing it on a variety of data as well to make sure that it evaluates correctly. So for improving performance or accuracy, more data, but more importantly, clean, meaningful data, meaning you got to go through a scrubbing process and think of the, the house price scenario that we talked about. You definitely want to eliminate any outliers. So for example, in a very rich uh, zip code like 90210 in Beverly Hills, if there's a home that has significant fire damage, obviously it's going to be sold for a much lower price. And if you don't have fire damage as one of your features to, to train it on, then obviously that's going to skew the data. So you want to remove anything that's out of the norm, go through a, a, a cleansing process uh, to make sure that everything is in alignment. And right along with that, you want to mention data with context. So in the example that I showed, we went off of square footage only and price. However, realistically, there's context behind that for the, the price of a home. There is, uh, you have to look at, like we mentioned before, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, uh, all the various amenities, uh, whether you have ceiling fans, walk-in closets, so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, uh, use cross-validation. And that's basically where it's a model evaluation technique that splits the data into several partitions. And then you train multiple algorithms on these partitions. And so this could be a very effective tool for training models with a, a smaller data set where you essentially divide and conquer, but it can produce very meaningful data. Uh, also, utilizing different algorithms. And if you noticed when we ran through the first scenario and I set it to train, uh, even though it was 10 seconds, it went only through a couple different algorithms but if had, had we given it more time, actually, let's do that. So this was the application. And let's go over here into training. Let's point it again to the same data. So there's the Yelp data. And let's go over into the train tab. What's missing here? Oh, select column one for the, the label. Then the next step is to start training. So I'm gonna change this from 10 to 100 seconds. And then you'll see that within the output window, it's gonna start going through a variety of different trainers. So there's a second trainer and there's a third, a fourth. And eventually it's gonna start cycling through all these different trainers to reevaluate itself. So we'll leave that to Chug. And the results will improve as we let it run with time. And so getting back into our PowerPoint. All right, so real world scenarios. Um, now, where can this be useful? I know Tolga works in, in a retail or customer facing type of business. Um, so obviously this would work in, in predicting prices. Uh, it could also work with uh, Making recommendations, like we mentioned earlier, if I go into an auto parts store and I buy oil and an oil filter, and I also make a recommendation that, hey, other people that have purchased these items also purchased an oil, an oil filter wrench to go along with it. So it could make that recommendation. Um, another thing- I do thing, work in auto parts, so thanks, Sam, for the tip. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I do work in auto parts, so- I know, a I'm a big car buff, so I, uh, I wrench on weekends, so very familiar with all that. Nice. Um, but uh, yes, so it can make recommendations. And as we had seen before on Amazon, uh, it always tells you people that have purchased this product also purchase these. And in some cases they lump them together and say, now you can buy all three for the low, low price of what have you. So there are multiple real world scenarios that can be utilized for this, but the key is to train it correctly on the, the right data. And some gotchas that I wanted to mention.
Drew left the link for the house pricing prediction. I'd have to go through that. You can always use Zillow's uh, house predict uh, house price predictions, right? Absolutely. <laughs> That's one way to go about it. I wonder, you know, I mean, you would think like a company like Zillow where definitely had some issues with the house price predictions, you know, they had to have spent massive amounts of machine learning um, to accomplish what they did. And, you know, they still had all these very serious issues. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, there were other issues involved there where they kind of were skewing market values as well. Uh, so, I mean, they're a force to be reckoned with when it comes to real estate. But the bottom line is you definitely want to have a good amount of data to train your model on. And the, the beautiful thing is this can be applicable to a lot of businesses. And a lot of businesses, almost every business has tons and tons of historic data uh, that's archived. That can all be leveraged to train the model and to be able to get uh, a good result set out of it. So it's something that almost every organization can utilize. Are any of those algorithms, uh, or, or even the library itself, do they have to be licensed and if you're using them for commercial or enterprise purposes, or is that all uh, just freely available? So with this type of demo, it's uh, specifically within um, ML.net and within the .NET environment. So it's a NuGet package provided by Microsoft. So it, it, naturally, it's, it's free to use. Um, now, if you're talking about other ML uh, packages, that may differ. So, so that would be it would be free to use even if I was using it for a client and in a commercial environment? Yes. Okay. And as you see here, when we look back on what we had done, we had let it run for 100 seconds. It came back completed, but you see all the variety of different algorithms that it went through. And in some cases, it just kept repeating this. So we have light GBM regression ran as the fourth iteration and then ran again as the eighth iteration um, and then continued to run through a variety of different algorithms to get a better accurate value. So if no other questions for me, I have some questions for you. What did we learn here today? If there's one thing you could walk away with, what would you say? Well, for me is I had no idea it was actually all built in. I thought you were going to, you know, start with a brand new project and just download a new get packet somewhere and, you know, do something with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that I, you, 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 you showed the ways to enable it. I remember when I was installing .NET Core, that was a checkbox there. Uh, actually, I think I was installing Visual Studio. Yeah, it was Visual Studio I was installing, but I seen the checkbox there. Um, so yes, and uh, yes to both. Basically, if you look at the the first example, we specified in the installer we wanted to add the desktop development environment, and we selected the checkbox for machine learning. Right now, for the other example where I did everything from scratch, programmatically. Up on top, there was a NuGet package that I had to install, which is the Microsoft.ml. So, you know, either potato, potato, either I get it installed through the installer or I do it manually if I'm doing everything programmatically. But essentially, they're all using the same thing. Very cool. I mean, you're basically accomplishing uh, all the machine learning. Now, I, mean, I know you mentioned you had a disclosure of, you know, if you're using other ML components, then, you know, there, there's definitely other components you can use. But you can accomplish machine learning with just the Microsoft provided tools. And it um, seems like there's a very clear pattern of getting you started. So I'm oh, very impressed with that. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a lot I don't know, a lot more to it, actually. So um, it's very- That's one of the things I love about the Microsoft world is they kind of uh, democratize and, and made life easier for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So they've abstracted a lot of the, the heavy math and the, the algorithms. And it basically came down to point and click and bringing in the right libraries. Uh, but again, the where the rubber meets the road is the, the cleanliness of the data and the amount of data that you're giving it, right? You, there's no escaping that. But they simply, they simplify things by making that road a little bit uh, easier to go down on. That was really uh, informative, Sam. I, I, if you're asking one thing we learned, I, one of the things that I was expecting was that I thought this would be more tightly coupled with Azure. I, I figured this was probably gonna be some sort of service that you upload your data and maybe define some parameters, but that the heavy lifting was probably going to be something that was done as an Azure service in the cloud. And uh, so I was a little surprised that uh, that it was all really designed in, to uh, to run on your own computer. Well, if you recall the first screen that we went through, the splash screen where I was adding in machine learning, there were some models that uh, I could utilize Azure and others where I could run it locally. Uh, typically when you train the model, obviously if you're training it on millions of rows of data, you don't want to tie up your server doing that. You could certainly do that in Azure. And again, depending on which model you're using that will allow you to run it in Azure. Right. 
Yeah, so, if I remember correctly, one one of the uh, one of the categories was, uh, I guess, image recognition or image processing, and I think that was an Azure service. So that, that kind of makes sense, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Drew, did you pick up anything from it tonight? Anything useful? Uh, yeah, Microsoft makes things really maybe dangerously easy. I'm gonna say. A little bothered by like, here's a model. You don't have to know anything about it. <laughs> But well, uh, it looks clean. It looks nice to use, though. So let me ask you, why is that bothersome for you? Uh, for example, like on the house pricing thing, uh, it might it'll give you a prediction. But if you don't know or understand which model you picked, you might not have any idea how it did that interpolation. Mm -hmm. um, that's just like just one point. So is it for the sake of knowing, or do you feel that it could actually predict the wrong value depending on the algorithm that it uses? If you treat it as just complete black box. And when it gives you something that's not correct, you have no idea why. So it is a bit of a black box. I agree with you. However, uh, in the end, it, it does give you results on uh, the the ones that were most successful. Um, so as listed here, top five models explored. Huh. And then it gives you some uh, statistics regarding um, the RMS loss and uh, the number of iterations that it went through. Yeah, but four of those top five are the same model with just a different number of trees, I think. Yeah. So if you don't understand where forests fail, then using a forest might bite you later. I have to agree with you. I mean, to be fair, like if you have some super complicated deep neural net, you also have no idea what it's doing. Right. But that's what I, you know, I was gonna say. That's what I hear a lot is, you know, the more complicated and more data you got, like people just can't explain exactly how it's determining what it's determining. You know, even the yeah, smartest people talking about this stuff is uh, here that from, which is kind of crazy. So forests are actually nice. Like you can, um, at least for like random forests, I think that might be a gradient boosted forest. But if you have like a random forest, you can actually like write it out to C code and just go read it. It just turns into giant nested if else's. So like you can manually inspect what's happening. It's just painful, but you can do it. Um, that is like the way you train them is a little bit magical in some sense, but the actual output is easy to interpret. Yeah, I see your point. OK, any other questions, comments? All right. So we talked about uh, three different ways of creating the, mach uh, the machine learning model. And that was uh, either through the UI, uh, doing it programmatically, or doing it through the command line interface, which we didn't touch on. But uh, you can do it through the CLI. Uh, we talked about the variety of different scenarios that you can use. Talked about how you have to train the model, and you, as you increase the amount of time, that it increases the accuracy. Some uh, documentation, if you're interested in reading more about it, um, Microsoft Docs has a great write-up on it. Uh, there's the uh, docsml.net guide. Uh, in addition, there's the glossary of terminology, and then uh, improving performance for machine learning. If you'd like to learn more, uh, either to have uh, a consulting uh, consultant uh, help out with some of your machine learning projects or uh, in, in a class. Uh, at NIS Technologies, we provide consulting as well as education, uh, a variety of courses available on our website. And more specifically, if you need to get in touch with me, uh, you can find me either on Linktree. All my links are available through there. Or you can just reach out to me directly uh, through email, snasser at nistechnologies.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, at Sam Nasser, and uh, my blog where I post technical articles as well as technical events, samnasser.blogspot.com. And lastly, I invite you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. And so with that, if there's no other questions, uh, I thank you all for having me and uh, thank you for attending. And even though the presentation is coming to a close, doesn't mean the dialogue stops here. If you are interested in learning more about machine learning and you start doing this on the side and you run into a glitch or you have any other questions that pop up, uh, I invite you to connect with me, uh, either email, LinkedIn, or a variety of any other means. I'd be happy to help you uh, offline. So with that, uh, thank you all again and uh, hope you have me again. It was a pleasure. Well, it was fantastic having you. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for excellent presentation and uh, very informative. And I think it definitely helps, uh, especially with a developer like me, which hasn't really spent much time with uh, machine learning and a little difficult or, you know, sounds intimidating subject to get into. I think you've shown today that that's, that's not the case. You can definitely get into it. And, and to Drew's point, you know, it, you know, there's probably a lot there that you probably need to learn, but Step one is just to be able to get into it, right? And I think you 
been very helpful demonstrating that that's not difficult to do. And um, um, it's definitely going to give me some um, projects, uh, personal projects I can go play around with this stuff. It's not rocket science, you know, to get a um, uh, machine learning project going. So thank you very much for that, Sam. Really You're appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, next month, Thursday, this time, we're going back to Thursdays, uh, June 2nd, we're going to have Kevin Fiesel come, and he's going to be presenting on the uh, some of the powerful things you can do with F Sharp, uh, including the um, uh, types of measures, uh, F Sharp, powerful types and systems and support for unit of measures, and what they can provide for you over what C Sharp, for example, can provide. So come check that out. I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation to have. So looking forward to seeing you all there. Until then, bye. All right. Have a safe trip, Olga. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, all right. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.